so I think we are ready to start. Can you hear me? It's okay? Yeah? Good. So, uh, first of all, welcome to the Institute of Theoretical Physics and to the ICTP uh, South American Institute for Fundamental uh, uh, Research. And uh, so I, I am Roberto Krenkel, and I'm the organizer and the person that gives the lectures in the morning. Uh, the other organizer is Paulo Inácio Prado from uh, University of São Paulo, he's sitting here. And uh, so, before we start with the lecture, I will uh, spend some time explaining you how this school is organized and what you are supposed to do and how things will work. So, first of all, the school is organized in the following way. In the morning, you have one lecture. It's the only lecture of the day. 9.30 to 11, more or less. We will try to start on time, although today we failed with this, <laughs> that part. Anyhow, we will try to start at 9.30. And uh, we will have one lecture. The rest of the time at the school is, uh, is for work on projects in groups of six, five or six persons. So we will have from 11 a.m. to uh, 6 p.m to work on every day on, on your projects. And then we have some activities uh, at 6 o'clock. Right? So every day, not all days, but uh, today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, we'll have activities at 6. I will explain in a moment what kind of activities we'll have at 6. Okay? So, The subject of the school is mathematical modeling in biological systems in general, but we will be devoted to problems which are connected to population biology, which has applications to ecology and epidemiology. So the projects that you will work on will be connected to ecology and epidemiology. So, this project, so we will have 10 groups, 10 projects. The projects are open-ended. It's not an exercise, just do this. You will get into, in, in, you, the, the way that you will see the project is it's a, it's a, uh, it's a web page. Every project has one page. There's a description of the project, and then there will be some questions. The, the project is based on papers which do not contain equations. These are biological papers in ecology and epidemiology. Okay, are papers which are usually recent papers which have interesting ideas, but there's no modeling in the project, in, in, the, in, the, in the papers. The modeling will be up to you. Okay. So, what, uh, I can give you an example of how these things are. Maybe it's better than make it too abstract. Let's see here. This will be the page. How do you increase this? Oops, where's the, hmm? okay. The projects are, are on that page. It, you just write ecology, ecologia dot ib dot usp dot pr ssmb. 
and then you get to this page. And you see there's a list of 10 projects here. Okay? Each of them has a description. See? Usually there's some fancy photos or, or drawings or something. So there's an assignment questions and challenge. Challenge are more, if you have time to explore more advanced topic. And you have references, and you can get the references from the internet usually here. If you, if you are connected to the internet at, at, at the Institute of Theoretical Physics, you have an IP number where you can download ex almost any paper in the world. Okay? So, so that, that's the way you get in touch with the projects. The groups are not self-organized. You have already been put into a group. At the end of the, of the lecture, you will get uh, outside there, and you get which group is yours. Okay? The groups are organized. In the, in the, in also, they, they are not, not uh, just uh, uh, taken uh, um, randomly people. It's organized in the following way. You have typically the groups are of six persons, and you uh, We'll have groups which have half of the people with a background in biology and half the people with a background in uh, physics and mathematics. Okay? So the idea is that this will be really interdisciplinary work in the groups. This is something uh, I, I think everybody knew this, but if you didn't, uh, here, it, this is a very mixed audience. It's really 50-50 audience between biologists and physicists and mathematicians. Okay? So that's the, that's the... And this is also a challenge for the groups, because you will have to cooperate having very different scientific backgrounds. Okay? So from one point for... for for people with a background in, in, uh, in physics and in math, you will have to, to go really and try to understand the biology that is in the project and then create something out of this. And, and the task is not creating something very complicated or mathematically profound thing. It's something that has to do with the biological reality which is being modeled. Okay? And for people from coming from biology, you will have also a challenge that is you have to simplify the problems. You will see that uh, there is usually a propensity of, of people from biology trying to put everything to, uh, in the project. You get an enormous amount of, I mean, system of uh, 20, 20 differential equations and, okay, and uh, thousands of parameters and so on and so you have to simplify and this has to come from your interaction and in the group okay so this is the main um, this is the main uh, challenge in the groups okay? well, uh, in practice the groups will uh, where will you, the groups meet okay so we will have in the third floor we have uh, lecture rooms in each lecture room, you can have two groups. Then we have um, here, you can work here. Two groups will be allocated here. You can use the blackboard in the afternoon. And there is a computer uh, uh, room in, um, in the third floor where you can also allocate two groups. So this is how 10 groups will be distributed in, in space here. And, okay? and uh, also, at the end of the, of the lecture, outside, there will be a list of group one, lecture room number X. Okay? Good. Let me emphasize also that uh, we are not only a mixed audience of, uh, of uh, people from biology and from physics and math. Uh, we are also mixed in terms of language. Our official language is English. So I know that we have a lot of people that speak Portuguese, a lot of people would speak Spanish. There's a tendency to, okay, to connect people and say, oh. So, it's obviously it's not forbidden to speak <laughs> Portuguese or Spanish, but we want that, uh, that when you are working in groups, 
and you have people that don't understand uh, your language, please speak in English. Okay? We don't want to have segregation. People that do not participate, because, okay, all of these guys are speaking Portuguese, so I don't understand, and so I go somewhere else. No, you have to be inclusive, and we expect you <laughs> to, to really try to pe have everybody interacting in the language that is common to everybody. Okay? Well, in order to these projects to succeed and to help you, we we'll have monitors. We have, I, I don't know even the number, it's a bunch of monitors, it's kind of 12 or 15 people, okay? Which are people that have already participated here in the past, people have experience, and they will get in touch with you this afternoon. They will go to your group, say, I'm the monitor to, to, for your group, and so on. They will give you suggestions, they will tell you, okay, uh, the idea is not to direct your work to a specific uh, 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 goal. The, the, the idea is that with experience, sometimes you know that certain ideas are a dead end. That this will not be okay. You, you already see this. That this will, that that's an idea that will not have, give you a, a, a good uh, result. So more or less, people will say, okay, you see, I can already see that this this is not a good idea, and so on. Okay, so they will be there to help you. Okay. Um, okay. So I think that's that's it for the part of uh, how the school will uh, be organized, how what we expect. So, okay. So at the end of the school, there will be presentations. If you have seen the the um, the program is on Sunday. We have presentations. Okay, so uh, each group will have a certain amount of time, typically 20 minutes, um, half an hour, uh, to make a presentation at at the end of the school of the results of your project. Okay, we expect that uh, we have high expectations for your results. Okay. You know, we, we are looking forward to have a presentation, typically a presentation that you'd give it at a workshop. Okay? So it's not like it's not like uh, high school, all the group comes and everybody says in two minutes, no. We want a, you have to have a speaker, a, a person that presents the group. It can be two because sometimes there's the, like, the more biology in my, my subjects that I need a biologist to explain or, or a physicist, or, okay, but maximum two. And uh, so the idea is that you, you will have a good presentation at the end, okay? Um, so, then, uh, okay, about the evening sessions. So today we have the first evening session at 6 p.m. And this evening se session is devoted to the following. Each group will have five minutes to present their subject, their project. No results. Just say, we will work on this and this. That's, that's a system. And, and the questions that you have thought about and so on, it's very, very, it's just to, to kind of make everybody know what the other projects are, not only ours. Okay? So, uh, five minutes, and please, it, you don't need to, to, to have a PowerPoint or you can, whatever you want, if you want a PowerPoint or, but it's five minutes, because ten groups, five minutes, you know, and usually then there are some questions and so on, and we don't want to go until, I don't know, very late in the night. Okay? So, this is the first evening session, and that's, that's your uh, main objective. Uh, today, to make this presentation. Tomorrow we have an extra class on a uh, uh, very practical class, which is not, uh, it will be uh, taught by Renato Coutinho, who is disappeared, uh, which is one of the uh, monitors, uh, senior monitors. 
And uh, we have senior monitors, which is Renato, who disappeared, as you will see, and Paula, which is sitting there, which are people that have been at school for years and years. So, so they organize the monitors also. And um, so Renato will, uh, will tell you about very practical implementation of how to solve ordinary differential equation numerically in Python or in R. Okay? Things like, if you don't know this, you have a crash course, and next day you are solving the equations, plotting the solutions, making a bifurcation diagram, things like that. Resonances or things very, very easy so that everybody that you can have on your computer, you can do it yourself. The, the part of, which is the easy part, solving numerically ordinary differential equations. The mathematics that's involved in, in the project has been, it, it's funny, it's, it's possible to, to approach the, prob the problem, the, the project, with ordinary differential equations. Maybe you don't want ordinary differential equations, you may be to other methods. You are free, the project is yours. We, we didn't put projects that have partial differential equations, that you need partial differential equations, but maybe the groups decide if wants to do something with partial differential equations, you are free to do that. Or maybe you want to do simulations with uh, agent-based uh, or uh, IBM or whatever, you are also free to do it. But in principle, the project can be, uh, you can work with ordinary differential equations. You can also, if you decide you want to go for stochastics and uh, 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 um, stochastical uh, pr uh, approaches, you, you are free with, for your problems, okay? Good. So, I think we are ready to start with the, with the lecture. Maybe you have uh, questions about this uh, part of organization or you have any question, please. And, and uh, I, I like people to interrupt me, okay? You, and, and we want, uh, want heat, yeah? We want, uh, we want discussions during the, 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 the lectures. Okay? So you, if you don't have any question, we will proceed. Hmm? Oh, okay, the, uh, this is uh, on Thursday. Uh, Bestiano is a, it's a nice name for ask any question you want. Okay, will be a question, answer, uh, question and answer session on an, any subject you want. Okay, answers are not uh, necessarily the best ones, uh, but uh, you can ask any question that you want. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, and uh, so uh, for any problem related to your uh, to registration to your accommodation or your travel and it, I don't know I, I'm not involved in this part of the organization there's the secretaries that can take care of this if you answer if you ask me you, ask, you could ask anybody in the streets I'd have the same knowledge okay so ask them yeah. So today, we have a very, very elementary lecture. This is just to set the stage, okay? Which is uh, single species dynamics uh, and population dynamics, okay? So this is the very easy part. It's to, to start slowly and then go a little bit faster tomorrow, okay? So, so we'll talk about populations and uh, the, the classical models for single species. I will explain you what a single species means, or if you don't uh, know. Uh, and then a uh, series of generalizations and so on. So first of all, population. For us, population will be a kind of primitive concept. It, why? And attempts to define population in a more rigorous way will take time and are always like, yeah? usually we're talking of a single species, of a population of, I don't know, of, of a certain animal or a certain species of plants. So usually there's an identification of species with the populations being 
population being formed by uh, uh, one, one species. But this is 90% of the time, but not necessarily so. You can have uh, talk about, about the biomass. For instance, if we will see it in, uh, in one of the lectures, dynamics of biomass in semi-arid regions, how, how you have desertification and so on. Then you will talk about biomass, and the population will be described by the biomass. We are not talking about the species, but you are talking that all, all biomass is involved. Okay? So you, not necessarily a population is a species, okay? but most of the time it will be. Okay? So, well, it's obviously a group of living organisms, uh, and uh, our basic postulate uh, will be uh, that uh, every living organism has to arise from another one, which uh, has this nice Latin uh, formulation of uh, Hutchinson, om vivum ex vivo, and um, therefore they reproduce. Okay. We will study populations, not individuals. We will always be concerned with the concept of population, not individual behavior. Individual behavior can have uh, uh, an effect at the level of populations, but they are not st studying, for instance, the behavior of the, of the, of the organisms. So, um, so they change in size, they grow, they decrease due to birth, death, migration, right? so, and the basic modeling problem that we will uh, look here is we want to describe how populations change in time. We could also study how they change in space, but it's not the topic of the school. So the dynamical behavior, how they change in size, uh, and we want to do this in a mathematical way, which will, will mean what? We want to incorporate biological phenomena that produce change of the size of the population. Okay? So if I say I have a population described by, by some function n of t, okay? so how do I describe the, 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 how the size of the population changes? Uh, one way is just saying that this is the how the population this is the description the derivative describes how the population change in time and uh, and then you want to write on the other hand of this equation some biology in mathematical terms obviously okay then you put here birth death competition predation mutualism whatever happens whatever biological mechanisms you want to describe that causes a change in the population size, okay? So th that's more or less the... And your models will be as good as you, you put here uh, the relevant biological uh, uh, informations and uh, well-formulated in mathematical terms. So the basic framework is uh, we want to study this, uh, these laws for about uh, how population change in time. Uh, our main description of the populations is the number of the individuals. Could be also biomass, or, but usually it's the number of individuals. And um, just to mention that it, it, it seems obvious, but it could be not so obvious. You could describe populations in, in, in many, many ways. You could want to have very detailed criteria, okay? The population of human beings here could be described by the list of names of them, for instance, or whatever, or other things. But uh, our basic description is a very simple one. It's just the number of individuals, okay? That's the description of the population. Um, Ah, okay, there's, there's this observation that the populations will, uh, when, you, when you describe a population, saying, okay, population of a certain animal, uh, I give the number of individuals of this animal. That's what we call an unstructured population. A population has a structure when you say, okay, now I have a certain number of individuals of, of, of one given species, and, uh, well, 
uh, there's a certain number of males and a certain number of females. There's uh, juveniles, there are uh, old ones, and all of these are structures, age structure, sex structure, and so on. So, but this is not really something very different. You, you say that it's, you can think of a population of this species being formed of subpopulations of the of the classes. Okay. Uh, so time variation, as I told you, will be given by by the use of differential equations by derivatives. You could also do this in a different way. You could use what's called discrete time um, uh, description. This good time description is something like this. I have a population at time t, and I want to know at a further time t plus 1. Then you would say n of t plus 1 is a function of n of t. So this is a mapping okay, of discrete time. Okay? And t plus 1, you could ask uh, how, 1 what? Okay, 1 what? Uh, usually it's 1. Uh, unit of time, which can be generation time, can be years or whatever. Okay, so that's also a way to describe populations. Yeah? Some, sometimes it's very useful to do this. Okay, but we will will be on the side of differential equations. Okay, so and we will want to build models based on this idea: change in time equal to processes that that make the population change. So the first and the model ever formulated about population dynamics is due to Malthus. And this is a very, very trivial model. It says just that the change, uh, the time variation of the size of the population is given by a linear equation. Okay, Which means that if you think this is the rate of change of the population per capita is a constant. Okay? You can think in this way. Okay? So this, this, this incorporates the idea that somehow uh, every individual will, in average, uh, have a certain number of offspring and uh, this is given by this, uh, which produces this constant uh, uh, per capita uh, uh, time variation of the population. So this is linear equation, which is the first differential equation that you ever have seen in any. If you have seen a differential equation, that's the one that you have seen first, probably. And uh, so this idea comes from from. For Malthus, uh, we are talking 18th century. Um, uh, and obviously, the solution is what we all know. This is just the exponential, which has this kind of, uh, you have an initial population, n0, and you grow exponentially in time, like this. Yeah. Ah, what's the solution? Okay. Okay. So let's us. Uh, that, that that that's probably more a, a question for people that have not uh, studied uh, differential equations and uh, probably people coming from the biological uh, science. So what's about what's a differential equation? The solution of differential equation is a function, okay, which is such that you have here. You have a nick here, let me let write here again. If you write this, you want to know the function n of t, okay, such that the derivative of the function is equal to r times the function, okay? That's the solution, okay? Well, solutions depend on initial conditions because this says, for instance, that I can predict the population in the future, okay? But in order to predict the population in the future, you need to see, know how many individuals you have right now. That's the n, n0, because at time t equal to 0, at n e equal 0, it's n, n0, okay? So this is, okay, this is a one-minute course on ODs, okay? Well, 
So this is just exponential growth, which you say it's obviously impossible to be true, because you would have an enormous amount, if populations grew exponentially, then you had, you'd have infinite growth of all populations, and then this does not happen, and you just look around and you are not, it's not true. Okay? Well, uh, yeah, now, oh, I want to go back, this is new. Okay. Just to have an idea, let's make a parenthesis on. Uh, I want you to guess if I have uh, if I have a population of this bacteria, E. coli, okay, and I start with one bacteria, one bacteria, okay. And I tell you that the population double size in 20 minutes. Uh, how long will it take to cover the Earth with E. coli? I'm open to to people that want to have guess this. So we have one person in 10 hours. One day, one week. Does it seem okay? Everybody's me? Okay, so in order to give an answer to this question, okay, you need to, what, what do you need to know first? You need to know how many bacteria you need to cover the Earth. In order to know how many bacteria you need to cover the Earth, you need to know the size of the bacteria and the size of the Earth. Okay? So, uh, I won't do the calculation here because it's, it, it's a question of time, but it's very easy. You go, just go and Google it and on Wikipedia. And it, but E. coli, there's the size of E. coli. Then you go, the, the surface of the Earth, you don't need even to calculate it, it's just somewhere in Wikipedia you will find this. And then you need to know how many bacteria you will need. And the second uh, uh, piece of information is, this one is important, okay? The population doubles the size in 20 minutes. This means that you can use this, this solution here, we are, we are saying that it's exponential growth. So, let's see, I, I start with N0, which is, uh, for instance, it's one, but uh, never mind. Then you say it will double the size into something which is this here. Okay? Now I can calculate R. Okay? And, uh, okay, then you you do the calculations, you get R, and then you say, well, you had calculated before how many bacteria you need, then you say, let's call this N Earth, will be, uh, in order to know the time, will be N, N0, I th I'm saying it's one, okay, one. E to R, which you have calculated before, times the time you need to cover the Earth, okay? So you can do this calculation, okay? That's that's easy. Okay, so th that's what people call a back of the envelope calculation. It's not very pre precise and so on. Blah, blah, blah. And, and it will give you about one day and a half, about 30, 30, 30, 30 hours. That's the. So, obviously, you see, you, you, start, you start with E. coli in, 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 in two days, you have. Are overfluted with, with the, are fluted with, the, with bacteria everywhere. So some, somehow, exponential growth cannot be true. But I want to make a, let's say, I want to make uh, say that the exponential growth is very important as a concept. Why? You know, there are things that cannot be. Uh, 
cannot be uh, experimentally assessed, but we believe in them anyway. So I have a, there's a very simple example. Take the Newton's inertia law. Okay? So you say that the, the, the state of movement of, uh, of an object uh, does not change if there is no forces applied on it. Okay? And you say, okay, I want to, I want to go and I want to, to verify experimentally the inertia law. In this. And you go there and you take an object like this and you say, okay, let's put it in movement. Well, it stopped. Okay? So it's, something happened. Well, you say, okay, it's friction, obviously. So the, the, the thing is not isolated. And I say, okay, I go to, to the lab and I get with my colleagues of, uh, um, from condensed matter physics or material science, uh, frictionless surface, okay, with nano stuff inside. Bro. Then you go on and, you, and it, there's no friction. It goes on and then it will fall here, okay? You say, okay, I need a larger table in order to verify experimentally the inertia law. But you say, always there will be something happening which, which prevents you to actually verify in the, in the simple sense that, but we believe in that, and we have real mechanics on it, and so it, it's part of the theory that's considered to be kind of limit truth. Okay? It's indirectly verified only. So directly it's not verified. So exponential growth is more or less like that. It says that if, if, if the population is unchecked, if not, nothing prevents it from, from growing, it will grow in this way, exponentially. Okay? So, in the, obviously, you will never be able to verify this, this in a strict sense, because there will be always something happening. You have your equal eye on a petri dish, and the petri dish has a certain size, and you go on with the experiment forever. And for populations of animals, plants, and so on, there will always be restrictions, there will be interactions, there will be lots. But somehow, this is, is, is still, it's not in opposition to the Malthus law. It's just that Malthus law has to be uh, taken as, if unchecked, the population will grow exponentially. Okay? So, and, and then you'd say, is this, uh, this is because, you know, I, I wrote here biology, okay? And uh, what's the biology I've put into this, into this model or this theory? It's just birth and death processes, okay? There's a certain birth uh, rate, a certain death rate, which are considered constant. And that's, and if, if obviously I'm taking R to be positive, it could, could be negative also, obviously. I'm, I'm taking it. Implicitly, I've taken it uh, positive. Um, so there are more births than death. Then obviously, population will grow forever. That's trivial, but okay. So you, in order to describe something more realistic, what you have to do is put some more realistic biology on your equation. With this, you can now proceed to more uh, realistic models. Okay. okay? Very philosophical, but... Okay, okay I have here some examples. That's like uh, population of the United States. Uh, and here we have what, can you see this? No. Uh, oops, back. There's a, a certain part of this curve which is well approximated by an exponential. Right? But obviously, it, exponential growth does not continue forever and you have a saturation. Okay? This is the kind of thing that we want to describe in, in with better models, okay? But there is a part of them which is, is well approximated by an exponential, okay? 
So why? Because, well, this, this is a typical biological invasion, okay? You have a territory and you have people uh, arriving. There's a resident population. And this shows that actually at that time, the resident population did not oppose very strongly the invasion of, of, uh, of the alien population. Um, and here you have, again, E. coli on a petri dish is like an exponential growth until you fill all your petri dish and, and, and then the experiment's over. OK, so let's go for something a little bit nicer than exponential growth. So we want to describe systems which, uh, which can have an exponential growth phase. We want to modify this equation in order to have the possibility of having saturation, okay? that somehow the growth will somehow stop. Okay? Uh, so the easiest way to do this, and we will now spend some time discussing this, is the following. So from um, typically from a mathematical uh, frame of mind, you have this. Okay? This is Mantle's equation. You want something which has an effect that is important when the population is, is large and has always a negative effect on, on the derivative. Okay? So the easiest thing is to put some minus, some, let's say, some uh, alpha, and some n square. This is always negative if alpha is positive, obviously, alpha positive. Okay, it has always a negative effect. And if the population is large, this one dominates. If the population is small, this one dominates. Okay, that's the easy way to say to fabricate, to just build an equation that does the job. Okay, that's well. And this is usually written in this way: one minus n over k. Okay, this is just a simplification of this equation. Okay, it's a uh, different way of writing this because that's the, it's just a, a question of uh, how people usually write this. And k has a name which is called the uh, um, k capacity. Carrying capacity. Okay, we will discuss carrying capacity from a biological point of view in in, in, the, in the second part of the uh, of this lecture. So now this this equation has some uh, some uh, um, because well because what we build the equation to have the properties that we want actually, okay? but it has also some other nice property, which is we can solve the equation. And we can find the solution. Then you'd say, could it be different? Sure. Most of the systems that we'll see in this, in this uh, summer school, which will be systems of, of the equations, or even on other kind of differential equations, will not be solved in the sense that we solve the Mantle's equation, which is the analytical solution in the, in the uh, jargon of physics. Okay? Doesn't mean that an equation that we don't have the analytical solution does not have a solution. It has a solution. In all the equation, not, not all the equations have solution, but the ones that we will see here, modeling reality, have solutions. We don't have an expression for the solution. Okay? So, what I mean by that? So, just maybe also a comment here. This should be no surprise, actually, because when you see, uh, you say, I want an analytical solution to, the, to my equations, then you, you, you would ask, well, what's an analytical solution? Ah, it's an expression given in terms of known functions, uh, given the solution in terms of known functions, okay? Well, if you feel from, from mathematicians, you would maybe laugh at this. Because why? Because what is known functions? That's a psychological definition. Okay? 
It's what we know. Mathematics does not actually care about what we know. So we know the sinus, okay? But what does it mean to know the sinus? Well, we have, we have studied the function, we have tabulated, we know that the, how to integrate the deriv derivatives, everything, all, all, everything we want about the sinus, but it has been studied and so on. It's a kind of, um, but this has more to do with the history than with the math, okay? So equations, can have solutions that we don't know how to write in terms of, an, of, of known functions. Okay? Doesn't mean that there's no uh, uh, solution. So, what will be the point usually is when we come to equations that we don't know how to write the solution in terms of known functions, what will we do? Okay? So, we will have, it's not so much the subject today, but tomorrow and day after tomorrow, there is something called qualitative analysis of ordinary differential equations. It's we want, maybe we don't want the solutions explicitly, we want just to know the behavior of the solutions. Oscillates, saturates, decays, and how this depends on parameters. And a lot of things can be done without having a solution. Okay? And while if sometimes it's too, too difficult to do this qualitative analysis, then you resort to numerical solutions of ordinary differential equations, which is a topic that you will learn about tomorrow at the evening session. Okay? So, but this one has a solution. <laughs> this one, you are happy and we have a solution because it's a very simple equation and can, you can find a solution and it's uh, very easy to find, actually. Um, okay, these are the guys that are... Uh, Pierre-François Verhuis, that's the guy that discovered, uh, discovered, that formulated this equation. Uh, to solve this equation, it's, it's, it's a matter of... Uh, some, it's a matter of some calculations, but it's, it's really easy to make this in a non-very formal way. You write this, okay? Then uh, as n is always a well-behaved function and so on, has no, no, no singularities and so on. So you just write this here. Okay, people from biology who are not acquainted with this, that it's the typical thing that physicists and mathematicians do. They take this fraction here seriously and say, okay, I can do this. Okay. Then I integrate both sides. This is trivial and this is also a known integral, okay? So I don't want to make the, the, all the, the, the steps here, but that's, that's how you do it, okay? This is known. Okay. You could ask, if I had something different here, Okay, I could do the same trick and I would have something different here. And usually you don't know how to make this integral. That's because that's why you don't have explicit solutions. Well, okay. And so integrate both sides and you will get this solution. Okay? So you look at this and say, okay, nice, I know the solution, therefore I know the solution for any R, any K, and any N zero. And um but to have a more intuitive uh, feeling about the solution, it's better to have a, a plot of the solution, okay? So you start with some n, n zero, and how is the behavior of this function? You put here k. The behavior is always like this. If you start with n zero above k, you have the k. Okay. End of the day, for t very large, n goes to k. Okay. That's, that's all about this solution. So, uh, okay, it's better than Malthus because it has saturation, but it's also like, okay, things grow and saturate, and that's, a, that's all it you can think about, okay? So obviously then you would say that I, if you go outside in the nature, the population that 
that oscillate in time. And this says that this is not, uh, this is a, a, a all, all population should go for a constant value, okay? So we have to change this also tomorrow, okay? So, but for the time being, that's, that's the idea. You have growth and saturation. You have, you have an equation. The equation can be solved analytically. And the, the, the solutions have this nice, uh, nice uh, plot here, okay? Everything grows and, or everything goes to K. Okay? That's the plot, if you want. Okay? So, um, um, in other words, uh, so I, I will introduce some jargon, but th there is a reason because we will use this jargon uh, uh, tomorrow, which is. Uh, I could say this equation has two fixed points. So what's a fixed point? Fixed point is a value of n, of the function n, which is a constant, and which is a solution to the equation, OK? So if you say n is a constant, okay, then you put a 0 here, and then you say, well, I need, I will call this va constant value, n star, then n can be this, this algebraic equation satisfied, n can be 0 or k. Okay? So you have two fixed points, n equal to 0, n equal to k. Okay? So uh, then, but if you look here, it's, it's obvious if you, if you start near 0, that zero, that this solution will also grow here. So zero is an unstable fixed point. And if you start near k, with n equal to very close to k, it will go after some time to k. Therefore, n equal to k is a stable fixed point. Okay? So. In general, this is a, uh, this will be this kind of of um, of uh, approach to, uh, will be used when we cannot solve the equation analytically. Okay, so we don't need this actually. What I'm saying here, we don't need it because uh, formally because we have the solution. But when you don't have the solution, maybe it, you can get a lot of information without the solution. Okay, so. With, only with this piece of calculation, saying I want to fix it points, okay? I can also I can get that at the end of the day you will be at uh, any any initial condition will go to a certain specific value which is the k. Okay? So uh, with doing without solving we can have this information here. Okay, um, unstable fixed points, unstable solutions. Are, are fixed points that are unstable are not seen in, in, in reality, in nature. Okay? Because every perturbation of, the, of an unstable fixed point will take the solution, or in this case the population, yeah, to some other value and will go away from the unstable fixed point. Therefore, if it's unstable, you don't see it. Then you, what you want when you have a system of equations and so on is to get the stable fixed point. Okay? This guy is, is a very simple one because there's only one stable fixed point. Okay? And uh, therefore, you, uh, you could have, uh, you could say, okay, uh, the first question is will the solution go to the stable fixed point? Okay? And uh, then you need something else. You, you should mathematically you should show that the solution is bounded. Okay, if it's bounded, and there's only one stable fixed point, and then it goes to this fixed point. Okay, in this case, because this kind of equation, which is first order ordinary differential equation, do not have oscillating solutions. Okay? Autonomous equations. So let's keep in mind this uh, kind of uh, of, 
of reasoning because it will be important in the in what follows. Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, you never get to k. So this is the problem with infinities. Okay. So you go asymptotically for time, uh, time uh, going to infinity. Then you get n goes to k at time infinity. So then you will say, okay, in practice, how 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 do you, you say I will never attain the cap carrying capacity for my Oh, well, then you say, OK, we cannot be so strict with this model. We will have, if you want, we have organisms. We have organisms that have sizes, and they are, and uh, somehow we say, OK, uh, very close is, in, is good enough for us. OK? So uh, you don't need it to be K. You can be 99% uh, of K. Okay? Then there's a then there's a finite time, OK? Because it takes an infinite time to go to k, OK? But it does not take an infinite time to go to anything below k, OK? Then it takes a finite time. And this finite time depends where you start. Yeah. k? No, k here is a parameter which is fixed. It's fixed. Well, you can, OK, I will discuss k biologically. Then you will see that we could have k as a function of time, but that's uh, different. That was, yeah. I, I didn't know. Well, that, that's sh depends on, on what you are, I mean, depends on the context, OK? Because uh, it depends. On, uh, for instance, if it takes a very long time to reach K for a population, you start with a small population, you have a very large K, and it could take a long time. Then you say, well, during this time, you will have a lot of of, of perturbations. You will have I don't know, seasons. You will have something happening, and the system is not isolated anymore and so on then it's relevant to know how long it takes to, how long it takes to 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 be close to k because you could be interested in this kind of situation okay? in practice so the, 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 okay So knowing the time can be interesting depending on what kind of problem you are studying. That's that's the answer to this. Um, so um, I want to make. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I will continue with this uh, reasoning, and then uh, I come to some other point that will be uh, more interesting. Uh, uh. OK, so that's what I was going to discuss later. But I, as you ask it, I will discuss it now. OK, so what is k? OK, what is k? So there are any sense saying the current capacity for a certain animal, for elephants, is x. No, there's no sense. Because what are we describing biologically here is what? what is, what's the meaning of the K? Okay? So the biology we are putting here is, has not been discussed fully. I will do something here, which can be. So K has to do, has to have a relation to what? To uh, what makes the population, uh, what stops the population from growing further? Okay? So this is, what are the limiting factors for the population? Okay? So one thing is, let, let's start with, back to Malthus. And let's say, get this R here. Okay? It's the in, intrinsic growth factor of the population. But you could say, okay, this guy, it's actually 
the rate of birth minus the rate of death. Okay? You have a certain birth rate and a certain death rate. Okay? So this would be, therefore, be like this, b minus g times n. Now, to go to the logistic equation, okay, I, I didn't tell you that this the equation has a name, which is logistic. Okay? There's a story about that, because what does it mean, logistic? Okay, what's the meaning of logistic? Nobody knows. It has been fabricated in the name by a uh, Belgium uh, uh, scientist, uh, Berhulst, in the, eight, in the 19th century. And uh, it was kind of, kind of slang spoken at the Ecole Polytechnique in France and so on. So that came, that stayed here, doesn't have anything to do with logistics like transportation, okay? So, okay, logistic equation. How do you go from this to this one? You say, okay, one population is, uh, becomes uh, uh, larger and larger. If you have a, 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 a lot of individuals, this somehow will modify, will modify the birth and death rates. So you could say, birth and death could depend on the population size, okay? So to say birth could depend on n. In Malthus, it does not, okay? But you could say oh, this and death rate also could depend on n. Okay? So why? Because well, if you have a larger population, you have a lot of individuals, then you can have limiting factors being important. For instance, there's no enough nutrients, no enough food. There's no enough space. Okay? So individuals of this population will have to compete for food, for space, for nutrients in general. Okay? And this will be important. The larger the population, more competition. Okay? Therefore, what you expect is that the birth rate will decrease with n, and the death rate will increase with n. And what's the mathematical function that is the simplest function that increases and decreases, uh, increases uh, or decreases with n, is, is just, there's a line, okay? B has to decrease, and uh, D has to increase, okay? And if you say B is something, uh, let's say, beta times n, and uh, plus B0, and D is some, uh, say, delta uh, times N plus D0, and uh, beta is negative, let's put, okay, let's put a minus, and if you plug in this here, okay, you will get to this equations just by renaming these constants, which will form your carrying capacity. Okay? So, now, therefore, the current capacity is, is a constant which incorporates the idea that the birth and the death rates depend on the size of the population. Now, how is this in, in, in practice? Okay? So you say, okay, there's no enough food. So, no enough food. Uh, how will this affect B and D? Right? So, in principle, it can affect in several ways. Depends on the species. We cannot be any more talking about generally on any species. You can have competition for food and say, say if we put a 20 sandwiches here, and we have to compete for the sandwiches. Okay, and you cannot share the sandwiches. Okay? So then uh, uh, 20 people will have enough food, and the other people will die. Therefore, if the competition is like that, it, the nutrient, uh, limitation of nutrients, creates, uh, 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 affects the death rate. Okay? And this is clear in this case. If you have 20 sandwiches, you have only five people, Okay, then there's enough food, 
and you don't have an, uh, an effect. If you have, if you have more people, then the effect becomes more important. That is, that's the way. Could be different. It could be a resource that can be shared by everybody. Okay, but if you have limitations, people will be weaker, will develop not so fast. So that can impact the birth rate because you cannot reproduce. So it can also impact the birth rate and lower the birth rate. And so, and so for other things also, um, for space. Uh, space will impact usually yeah, more birth rate, right? because you don't have where to put your offspring. Right? So these are the, bio the biological phenomena that are behind the, the, this kind of limitation, this kind of of equations, okay? It's the, limita it's the limiting factors. Now, the question was, okay, does, on what does K depend? So from this discussion should be clear that K will depend on the species, intrinsic properties, like uh, uh, its uh, uh, physiology, whatever, and of the environment. You can have a rich environment, which will have a lot of nutrients, a lot of space, and then the 4K is, is, uh, is, uh, is high. You can have a poor environment, which has a small K. There no, there's no nutrients. Right? So it's the relation between the species and the environment that determines K. Okay? So then you could say, OK, how do I know, how do I measure K? This would be. So and here we will start with the first discussion that will develop next uh, two, uh, two um, lectures about mechanistic models against phenomenological models. Because you could say, OK, I now want to know if this here is it. It's, is it true or not, the equation? Okay? You'd say, I want to do an experiment. OK, in order to make a prediction about the outcome of the experiment, I know R and I have to know K. R I can know, because I can do an experiment at first, an experiment, just to determine R, because R is connected to small populations. In the, you can get this, so that you can measure. But you say, OK, now I want to know the value of K. And then once I know the value of K, I solve the equation, I make a prediction, and I go to the, to the field or the lab, and, and I see if it's, uh, if it's valid or not. But how can you measure K independently of the, of the, the experiment that you want to use to, 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 to know if your equation is OK? So that's, it's, it's, that's why we call it the K a phenomenological parameter, because it's not determined for something from a lower scale, which would be the individual, the scale of the individual. Okay? So you cannot determine K without making the experiment that would confirm the equation. And that's the problem of non-mechanistic uh, models. A model will be said to be mechanistic if you can get all the parameters, parameters here in this case are R and K, independently, plug into the equations, and then get predictions. Okay? So how do you know the parameters? Usually, because you can, parameters which are connected to mechanistic models can be determined at the level of the individuals. Okay? Uh, and that's not the case here. Okay? So K, the current capacity here, is a phenomenological parameter. And it, uh, it's connected to this environment and uh, uh, relation to the, the, the population, how it relates to an environment. can be thought also that like a, like a, you have a complex environment when many things happening in K is kind of just being uh, the simplest description of the environment, how environment affects the population. So, yeah. Okay. Here you have some, uh, just some, have some photos, okay? This is, uh, so, as I told you, 
what we're describing by the logistic equation and by the concept of carrying capacity is that there are competition for nutrients or for space or whatever, Co competition which is called intra-specific competition because it's, it's internal to the population. At uh, next classes we will see inter-specific between species. But it's the competitions of the individuals of the same species for resources. Um, so, for instance, here, ladies on a pond compete for space. Yeah? And, uh, okay, so here you have the trees in Amazon, and Amazon and forest compete ex essentially for light. Because what? You could ask, what are, the, what are the nutrients that you need in order to be a tree? Okay? So, in, in order to be a tree, what do you need? Well, you need, you need water, minerals in the soil, and light. Okay? So, in the Amazonian forest, water is not a problem. It's very humid. Okay? So it's not a limiting factor, although it is, it's, a, it's a nutrient that a tree needs. It's not a limiting factor. The limiting factor will be the amount of, of light that you can have. It's curious because you'd say light is limited, yeah, but from the point of view of the tree, yes, because you can always be uh, uh, in, the, in the shadows of the other trees and then you don't get the light. So and this has to do with with the kind of uh, thinking about adaptation and evolution also. Okay? Why are trees high in the Amazon? Okay? They don't have this whole the trees that are super high. Okay? Because it's, it's better to be, if you, if, you are, uh, if, you, if you don't have problems with water. Because, I mean, if, uh, uh, a tall tree uh, needs a lot of water because there's all the water circulating in, in the tree. Okay? So you need a lot of water, but water is not a problem, okay? So you can afford to be a tall tree. You can have 20, 30 meters, okay? So you can be tall, and then there's some advantage because you can go over the other trees and with your canopy, get all the light you need, okay? So it's, it's, it's in terms of intra-specific competition, it's good to be a tall tree, okay? As opposed to this next situation, which is the semi-arid semi regions. Okay? Here, there's no water. There's, very, there's water, but water is limiting. Okay? So, and, and light is no problem. Okay? So, this, this is, is, is a typical image, and you see that most of the vegetation here does not have high large canopies they are not tall because you need a lot of water and you don't have a lot of water there okay? so um, you uh, it's better to be a kind of shrub and and uh, so you can have uh, you can live with without uh, too much water uh, without too much water and and uh, therefore uh, it, it, it's, it, it's not, uh, it's, from the point of view of interspecific competition, it's better to be small in this case. Okay? So that's how environment, and environment shapes also the carrying capacity. Okay? That's a plot of uh, an actual situation that is a very old uh, uh, thing uh, in, in the 30s, which is the uh, population of, uh, of, of sheep in Tasmania, and this is considered to be more or less a logistic growth. Uh, and here, uh, well, if you are a physicist or a mathematician, welcome to the, to, to the problem in ecology of data. Okay? There's no thing in ecology, in epidemiology neither, like clean data, okay? because it's it's, it's difficult to obtain population sizes, okay? That's a very, very difficult thing. So if you just say, okay, I, I go outside there and there's a tree. I want to know the number of ants on the tree circulating. There are ants circulating, I want to know the number, and I'm not allowed to just 
uh, kill the tree and the ants and count them. Okay, that would be a, a possibility to know the exact number. Okay, but you don't know. You don't. You are not allowed to do this. So how do you know the number of ants? Okay, and there's a problem of of doing what do you have to do. You have to, to sample. Okay, you have to sample and use statistics to infer the number of of ants, which has obviously a lot of uncertainties okay? and a lot of hypotheses behind that will sample, will we consider that the, the ants are distributed homogeneously or maybe not, maybe they have some more concentration here than there and so on. So it's, it's, it's a lot of, of hypotheses and statistical modeling in order to know the population size. Okay? So population sizes are are the main variables we study, but obtaining them in in the field uh, is not easy. Okay. Uh, I don't know, but uh, I, I think it it maybe has a, a logistic uh, a part, a part, but. Uh, then there, if you if you go further, then there would be, uh, I think, an increase which is uh, beyond. The, it'd be like this. And then it goes a little bit like this. Okay, so it, it kind of saturates, but it's still you can know exactly if it will saturate. But well, well, somehow it will have to saturate, but it was not exactly. Uh, in this example, what sets K is the availability of um, of nutrients for for the sheep. And in this example, this is a managed uh, population because it, it's introduced uh, and uh, 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 by farmers. So they give food to the sheep and leave them. And uh, what sets the K is it's the amount of food they have. That's the they compete for the food. Mm, yeah. Is it true that if you go to density, everything would be uh, microscopic? Because all the examples before, in terms of density, you should not have an extensive parameter. Am I right? Yeah, you're right. And uh, then K, uh, w when, when you go to densities, uh, usually will be uh, something that. Uh, you, you you go to densities usually when you are interested in situations where you have the density can vary in space also. Okay. And then K is not exactly uh, a population, it's also density. Because I mean you you need N over K as a, a number. If N is now a density, then a K is also a density. Because in this sense K is not related to biology, right? It's related to farmers. In this well, the biology is is the food, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah. But uh, yeah. the previous example it's more about microscopic dynamics. Uh, previ uh, the, you mean the, 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 the and so on? Yeah, that, that's that's more natural uh, without uh, management system. Okay, so uh, okay, yeah, sure, sure. Space probably availability of space. And uh, for human populations, well, in, in the UK, in, in the US, uh, one at the beginning, the, there's a lot, a lot of space. I mean, it, it, well, you have a resident population actually, but but this shows that the kind of exponential growth initially that the resident population was not opposing really strongly the invader invasion. Okay, so probably it's space competition for space, but also then you have well, you have cities, and then maybe there's something related to the size of cities and how to have uh, uh, nutrients, I mean, food circulating between cities. Yeah. Could also be that. Yeah, that, that's, that's actually the, the, the question could be posed that uh, what, limit, what limits popula uh, human populations in general? Okay, that would be. It's not a single, single, uh, single factor. It's many things. So, uh, OK, 
Okay, this is uh, okay, just for nomenclature and carrying capacity, phenomenological. So, okay, we're coming to the end of the lecture, but uh, well, not so much then. Uh, so, glory and misery. So, glory, it's simple and solvable and allows you to introduce a very uh, uh, useful. Uh, concept, which is the carrying capacity, which somehow describes interaction of population with your environment, which is a complex thing, and you are putting everything into a constant, which is nice, and so on. So that's the glory of the equation. Yeah? And obviously, its misery uh, is it's too simple to describe more complex situations, yeah? uh, and uh, does not model uh, more complex uh, biological facts. As we will see, not all populations tend to a constant. They can oscillate in time. Okay? So this is not described by this equation. Okay? So it cannot be that every, every, everything is this equation. Okay? Well, there are many other things. Populations of different species interact. We have here only a single species. Okay? So all of this has to be put into new models and building models for interacting species, for a network of interacting species, whatever. Okay. So, but you should still like the equation because it's kind of the minimal model that uh, where whereupon you can build better models. Okay. So, how would be the generalizations? Well, okay. Uh, still, in the context of a single species, you could have things like that instead of having uh, your nice logistic equation, you could, in principle, have something more complicated, which is a function of n. Okay? So I will give you one example, uh, which uh, it's easy to, to work out, which uh, puts into the, the game a new phenomenon. So, we still have um, birth and death, and we have this, this people call this, in the jargon of, of population ecology, this is uh, density dependence. We have size or density dependence, too. But you, you will, we will introduce a new phenomenon, which is in certain species need a minimal size. Certain species cannot grow unless they have a minimum size. Why? Different species, different reasons. But for instance, this is if if the population is has if there's a predator, okay? and uh, sometimes the defense against predators depends on the size of the population. Okay? So uh, small population maybe can be just die out because they cannot defend against a predator. Okay? That's, that's one possible reason. And many other depends on so specific uh, uh, species. Uh, uh, many population need, need small, uh, minimum sizes. If, if the reproduction of, of the population is sexual, if you have a sm uh, two small populations, there can be difficulties in finding mates. Okay? And the population lines out. The possibility that, that for a small population, all the individuals are either male or female, is, is if it's, it's small, this, this, this possibility can be, I don't, don't mean very high, but uh, can be a, a number that could be seen. Uh, could have an effect, and therefore the population would die out because there's no reproduction anymore. So there can be minimal populations. And the, way, the, the best, uh, the easiest way to formulate this is to write, again, this, but multiply this by n minus, um, usually you would say 1 minus n over some factor that we call a. So. This, um, this, this equation here will have a carrying capacity k, a growth rate r, 
and a minimum size of the population equal to A. Uh, yeah, you are, you are right. N, N over A minus 1. Now, this thing, no explicit solution in terms of known functions, but we can easily see what will happen to this. Very easy. So let's do this piece of qualitative analysis of differential equations. So you have a kind of example of how to do easy and uh, simple qualitative analysis. Let's make a plot of gn dt versus n. Okay. So if it were the, this one, okay, this one would give you gn dt, the logistic equation would give you just a parabola, okay? And this one is a third third order polynomial, gives you something like that. This is K. This is A. And this is zero. So, let's see what we can do only with this plot. With this plot, we can start like that. We have fixed points, 0, A, and K, because, because D and DT is equal to 0 here, okay, at this point. So, in this region here, the der derivative is negative, okay? Therefore, if I start here, the population decreases goes here. Anywhere here, it goes in this sense. Okay? Therefore, the zero is a stable fixed point. If the population starts at this point, if you start here with our initial population, here, the dnDt is positive. Okay? Therefore, the population increases. You go this way all of time because of the because the, the population and the, the derivative has a pop, is positive. Therefore, this guy, if I start here to the left, I go to zero. If I start to the right, I go to k. Therefore, this guy is an unstable fixed point. And again here, if I start with uh, here, in, in this region, you have a, a negative sign. If you start here, you go this way, and therefore, k is a stable fixed point. And you see, you didn't solve the equation, but you know the qualitative view of what happens. If I start with a population smaller than A, it goes to zero. If I start with an A, it goes to K. Okay? So that's without solving the equation. Yeah. A perturbation, a small population, will grow. So if I'm here, at A, but say I'm I'm very close to A on this side. Then what will happen? This here is a, has an, a positive uh, uh, derivative, the, so it will go this way. So the point goes doesn't go back to A; it goes away from A. And the same thing on the other side. And okay? and here, if you start near this point here, okay? You go back to k, and we start on on this side. We also go go to k. So therefore, any pop, any if you perturbate your your fixed point, if, if it's stable, your solution converges back to k or to whatever value, and uh, if it's unstable, it goes uh, it div diverges. Okay, this is in the 
one dimension, for one equation, this is, uh, is what uh, there is. And well, then you obviously now you know the qualitative uh, analysis for any function f, any not, any well-behaved function f, continuous and so on. If you say now, and the NDT is something that goes like this. Okay, you do the same reasoning. Okay, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. Then you go this way, that way, and so on. You repeat exactly the same thing for any function. So qualitative analysis for one-dimensional problems for one ordinary differential equation whose parameters do not depend on time. Obviously, k, uh, all of them are, 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 are param parameters. Qualitative analysis is trivial for this case. You can do it with the f just m with a plot. Okay? This does not answer more subtle uh, questions so of how long does it take and so on. For this, you need something else. But just having the idea of fixed points and what happens, it's 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 that problem. Okay. So here are some examples. One is the third order polynomial, which is essentially the same thing as here. Okay. Then there's this uh, this um, very interesting function here, which is uh, the first one, which is. Um, is a function which is the uh, our um, it's the logistic plus something which describes a, this describes a a budworm population which would grow normally in a in a logistic way but is predated upon by some birds okay? and the birds on the predate uh, the Predation by birds is only important if there's there are enough worms. Otherwise, the, the birds don't care. They won't do the effort to find a worm, uh, uh, which is difficult to find if there there are only a few of them. So, if the population is is uh, uh, high enough, then predation is important, and the predators' uh, population is not regulated by the worm. It's they are they can eat many things, and therefore having or not the worm. Uh, is is uh, the budworm uh, is is uh, is not very important for the population of predators. Right? So this is um, uh, well. Then there's this other equation which is used used in describing tubers, and it's a different context. Yeah. Yeah, this one, for instance, yeah, this this one, this one is is well, well, no, the the uh, spruce uh, budworm also that uh, has been this this model has been made in, inspired by what actually happens in, in, in no in in, in nature. Ah, uh, you ah, uh, okay. You you mean uh, you want a microscopic model that? Uh, um, I don't know if for all of them. You know better this, no, Paolo? Is, is that for all these equations there? Uh, can they be seen as the macroscopic description of a microscopic uh, stochastic process or something? I know that the, 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 that's true for the for the logistic, yeah, yeah. But I don't know for the others one. Uh, I've not uh, seen anybody discuss this, but. Uh, Maybe good question. I don't know. For instance, so it's true that, uh, for instance, the logistic equation and obviously the the Malthus equation can be seen as the microscopic realization of of a microscopic problem, and which is usually a stochastic process. Okay. Okay. This is what I already told you. I mean, kind of. Inversion, qualitative view of the dynamics. We will. Uh, I will want to reinforce that we will do this a lot. Okay, finding fixed points, 
finding how solutions look like without having the actual form of the solution. Um, so the final comments. So uh, is so with Malthus equation. We introduce the parameter, which is the intrinsic growth factor, which is the R, okay? which is the balance of birth and death rates okay? in the population. So it has it's a dimensional parameter. Okay? So GNDT, um, this has dimensions. You could say population. Actually, population is, is not a dimension, but OK. Population over time, you have population. Therefore, the dimension of R is time to minus 1, 1 over time. OK? The dimension of this side have to be in the same dimension of this side. This is population over time. Therefore, this has to be population over time. We already have population. Therefore, R has to be 1 over time. Therefore, 1 over R is a time scale. What do I mean with a time scale? Well, say that the time scale of, of uh, uh, bacterial uh, uh, multiplication, I, I told you, E. coli uh, uh, double size in 20 minutes. Okay? So the time scale relevant for the change of size of the population is of the order of minutes. Okay? If you now want to go, go for milliseconds, you won't see anything. And if you want to go for years, it's also irrelevant. Okay? So things that happen on, on a certain time scale uh, uh, here for populations, there's a time scale associated to the, to the change of size going through to, to orders of magnitude different scales is usually not a good idea. Okay? If I say population, uh, human population on Earth grows at a scale of um, 50 years and so on, then this means that there's no real sense to, to, to ask, uh, I want to know the variation of the population size in this precise second. <laughs> Okay, because it's a completely different uh, time scale. And uh, if I don't want to go to millennium, uh, from thousands or 10,000, 100,000 of years, okay, usually this means that, the fun what, what does it mean? That your models are usually only correct at a certain time scale. At much larger and much smaller time scales, your models are usually not so good. And this is very clear in ecology, because when you do a strictly ecology, we are looking at, at populations and uh, species and so on. We consider the species fixed. And therefore, we go to dynamics of the species, growth, blah, 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 blah. And we are not, if we, this is valid on a certain time scale, if you want to go for uh, millions of years, you have to take into account the evolution. Okay? And the speciation, evolution, and all of that. You have to take into account that were, pff, everything is very different. Therefore, the, the, the models are not like the fundamental models of ecology. There's no such thing. Okay? There's no thing that would be valid over a lot of time scales. Okay? Usually you have a time scale which is connected to this scale where, where, uh, where the population changes, uh, uh, which is connected to this 1 over R. The same way we have another uh, scale and. the in our problems, uh, which is the parameter k, which is, is a number that represents a, a population size, okay? That says that the size of population attains after a long time. So it's the scale of population, okay? So this means that you now can say, I have a small population or I have a large population. I have a small population means I, the population is much, much smaller than k. And then I can say, OK, if it's much smaller than k, it will grow um, in, uh, exponentially. Okay? And now I can also say I have a large population, which means it's, it's close to k, or it's even uh, larger than k. So th this sets, sets the, 
the scale of what is large or not, or the small or not, in your population. It's the, it's the carrying capacity which gives you the scale. Ah, okay, so this there's now it's just an example. Uh, this is the population of, uh, this is about time scales, okay? So uh, this is the population of Europe between the year 1000 and the year uh, uh, 1700. And uh, it's crazy thing, yeah, crazy thing. And, uh, but now if you look uh, at uh, the population of the Earth, estimated, obviously, there's an estimation that people from archaeology do, uh, you see that you are whole bumps here, and if, if you go, go for larger scales, all your oscillations there uh, just don't, don't appear. Therefore, if you are studying at a scale of uh, 100 years, maybe you have to take into account a lot of processes that will explain why you have this kind of change. But if you go for a scale of 10,000 years, this is just something which is not very, very important, and you have the kind of exponential growth. Okay? So your model have to have behind the, the, the building of a model, you have to know what's the scales which are involved. So by the way, this is, is not difficult. Well, what happens here for, for this kind of behavior? That's the population in Europe in these uh, years. Yeah, that's the plague. Eh? The bubonic plague, that's the first, uh, the first, uh, uh, the, the first uh, decay, strong decay is, uh, it's in the middle of the 14th century. And then you have this other one, then it grows again, and then you have another decay, which is uh, in the 17th century, and everybody knows that in the Anno Mirabilis of Sir Isaac Newton, 1666, he was in the countryside. Why? Because he was fleeing the plague. That's what happened there. That's the, in London. There was plague in London, and he was in the countryside because he was trying to escape, and he actually escaped the plague. Very good. So, finally, what next? So, we have been studying here single, single populations, and it, it, everything more or less simple. If you look for, we will have all, always this kind of thing, okay? Which, and qualitative analysis is trivial, and so on. But we know that populations interact between different species, and we have not taken to this into account here. So tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, we will study how population interact. Okay? We will see how predation and competition affect the population dynamics. Okay? So this will be the topics uh, of the next. Uh, uh, okay. Populations are interdependent. Uh, networks can be complex. This is one of the, uh, uh, well, it's, it's not a real representation of a network. The, the easiest networks to, to study usually are in the Arctic, because there are not so many species. <laughs> it's not a very nice place. So, you, But you still have a lot of species, and you have more than that also. I mean, this is just a schematic representation of what would be a network of interacting species. In this case, this is a trophic network. Trophic means uh, consumptions of one species by the other. So you have uh, the, 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 the the, the, the plants, then you have the consumers of plants, then you have the higher orders and so on, and you go to the top predator, which in the case is the wolf. So, the final question is, if in nature you have always this kind of uh, uh, complex networks interactions, why do we study single species? Right. So, there are two reasons. 
Uh, first is, let's start with one and go for two and then for three and four, five. So that's a way of building knowledge, B way of building a theory which can then be applied to networks, which actually what is people in present uh, research do networks, the dynamics, and so on. Uh, okay, and uh, however, there are situations where uh, a species can be well described uh, by a dynamics of a single species, even with interactions. So let me give you this example here. Here is also Arctic, and this is a simplified trophic network of uh, the Arctic. You have a lot of species here, okay? So now I want you to guess. Uh, there is one species here which is well described by uh, single species dynamics. And I want your answers. Which one do you think is well described by a single species dynamics? I have time to wait. I need, I need, I need answers. Different speculations. You can be speculative. You don't need. The question is, which of these species can be described as a single species dynamics? Where are the mosquitoes? I don't see much. Ah, the blowflies. Now this. Where do you see? Ah, mosquitoes. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, the mosquitoes depend on having uh, uh, other species. They, they depend essentially on the hair and on the human in order to have blood. They are coupled, directly coupled to two species, to the hares and to the, and to the no humans, no, no mosquitoes. The hmm? The grasses. Uh, yeah, the grasses. Could be. Hmm? Yeah, it is determined largely by the weather, but you could have uh, if uh, it's very strongly connected to the hair, because the, there could be overgrazing. They could eat all everything. So if there is a large population of hair, there would be no grass. There would be a regulation between the hair and the and the grass. Hmm? I I didn't hear you. The fleas. You, you, you mean the blowflies here? The blowflies depend on that hair. Where do you see fleas? Ah, the fleas. Ah, the fleas need the hair. No hair, no fleas. Hmm? Hmm? The Arctic hair. Why Arctic hair? Precisely. It's the hair. Because the hair has a lot of interactions, either being uh, in being uh, the, the consumer or being consumed by other species. But no, uh, uh, not, not one of them is very important. For the hair, if there's, say, uh, what we have, uh, predators of the hair, uh, you have the wolf, okay, and you have the fox, but you know, if there, does the Arctic hair really depend a lot on the population of the wolves? Not so much, because, well, if there's no wolf, there will be the foxes. And still will be important. So I'm not saying, obviously, that a precise description of the system would not involve everything. But to a good approximation, populations that have a lot of interactions, of negative uh, 
uh, of, of opposite signs and so on, and have a lot of them, may, means that they can be interchanged one by the other. And this usually means that in this case, like in this case, you can have a single species dynamics for the hair. Okay? Obviously, the parameter k will depend on everything here. Okay? So it's like a single species. We we'll go to a current capacity, but the parameter k will obviously be connected to all the other species. Yeah? So that's the way that they influence the dynamics of the hair. So, okay, that's it. Uh, so, this, that's just a comment on what we want see in this uh, uh, in this uh, summer school, which is what I commented on uh, at the beginning, which is uh, we, you could have instead of differential equations, you could have other other formalisms, and then one that is used very very frequently is uh, discrete times. Okay, so you you don't have the continuous time; you have time given by say by years or by generations. Okay, so this is typically when you have generations that do not overlap. In, all, all generations have to overlap, but uh, sometimes that is very concentrated on a certain part of the time, certain time. So you have a generation one, then you have generation two, then generation three. That's very common with, with, um, uh, with, uh, with flies or with the mosquitoes and this kind of thing. So they have well-separated generations. You don't want a discrete time uh, uh, description. You want to say, I, the, generation one had 50, generation two I have uh, 30, I have generation three I have 100. That's, that's the thing that usually happens. So what you, will, what you want is some n of next generation as a function of present generation. And uh, the, the simplest uh, model, it's the Malthusian model for discrete time, is to write this linear relation. Uh, let me just see what notation I, I, I used an alpha. Okay, that's to say that there's a, a geometric progression. That's, that's, uh, and that's trivial high school mathematics. You can. Uh, get the, the solution immediately, but in general you can have a function here. Okay? Uh, so, just uh, to mention, there has been a lot of interest in, in these models back in the 80s. Why? Because even the simplest model, which would be the discrete logistic, okay, Discrete logistic would be this, uh, some alpha n, 1 minus uh, n over some, let's say, some other k here. It should be logistic, discrete logistic, okay? Depending on the parameters of alpha and k, this has chaos, this has oscillations, chaos, everything you want, okay? So people studied this a lot, okay? There's a whole debate of the relevance of this kind of situation in populations because uh, it seems that late nature, from biological nature, does not like so much chaos. You, know, you don't have field observations of chaotic populations. Okay, so this is. But okay, I won't go into this. We we will not study discrete uh, time mod. You can follow the, the 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 populations of certain species, for instance. Okay. Maybe I'm confused. I thought chaotic meant that you could change the initial conditions a bit, you change the final conditions a lot. But yeah. for a given path. It yeah. It, it, no. It looks looks, but I mean, it will oscillate uh, tremendously. Okay. And, and uh, yeah, it changes a lot. And if population changes a lot, it's probably an evolutionary problem. The populations. Yeah, very large and very small. This somehow 
is not seen, this kind of weird irregular oscillations. It's not seen usually. You can see it in the lab, because in the lab you can have population usually flies, and you can regulate the birth rate, the birth and death rates, just just change them, uh, such that the the population of the flies actually solves your equation. <laughs> it's chaotic, so it's a population that solves that's engineered to solve an, uh, an a chaotic equation. That's in the in the in the lab. And you could also have the time delay models. Uh, our models, which are all of this kind here, are called local in time. You could have models where uh, the population change now depends on a previous time. Okay? Well, one mechanism that could be uh, could generate this kind of effect is if you uh, look the population uh, of a certain species, and then you have juveniles that do not reproduce, and you have a major uh, reproducing uh, part of the species, and uh, and then you have the older ones. Maybe they don't reproduce neither. So uh, the population uh, change now is due to the population that was uh, of 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 individuals that can reproduce now and not of the whole population, meaning that the population that reproduces now was born a certain time ago, and therefore you have a time delay between uh, present, uh, present changes uh, with respect to the population now. Okay? So that's um, not local in time, and if you think about in your projects to use it Please don't, because <laughs> because these 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 are kind of wild beasts of um, in mathematics. These this, this equations are complicated. Uh, they are they have to be formulated in a different way. First of all, because they don't have an initial value problem. You have the initial value; it's an initial function. Okay, and uh, and even the. If you try to solve this, okay, which is linear time delay equation, linear, with, the, with these constants here, exactly, okay, you get an uh, oscillation. Okay. So it's very different. It's a linear equation and has oscillations due to time delay. Okay, so time delay can introduce oscillations. That, that's a fact that it's good to keep in mind. But the point of view of modeling with time delay equations, nonlinear differential equations with time delay, this will uh, need really, usually you have to go for numerical simulation. You have to go for numerics, okay? solve numerically the equations. But then you need some special techniques because it's not t local in time you need to do. It's not just like uh, ordinary differential equations uh, local, but you just have a code of uh, five lines that solves the equations. That will be, you have to know more things. Okay. So, take care with time delay. Okay. Uh, okay. So here are some references for uh, for today and for what well, for the course. So if you like, um, if 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 you have uh, a mathematical training, the uh, book of Murray is the basic book for mathematical biology. It's called Mathematical Biology. And then there's the book of Britton, who was a student of Murray, actually, and wrote a book that is just a simplification of the book of Murray, with less examples and so on. It's condensed, but it's also good to read because it's, 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 it's simpler. The, this book of uh, George Evelyn Hutchinson. Hutchinson is one of the uh, main ecologists who set the theory of our ecology in, uh, in the 20th uh, century. And he has a very nice book in, called Introduction to Population Ecology, which is filled with a lot of historical examples. So it's difficult to find a book. If you want to take a look, I have one. But uh, it's more like uh, I want to know the, everything, the history of everything behind how the theory was built. Yeah. If you are a biologist, 
Do you, maybe you would be more interested in a primary of ecology by uh, Gotelli, which uses also equations, but has a lot of time in biological discussion, and uh, it's, it's, it's meant for biologists, for ecologists, actually. Yeah? The book of uh, um, Elements of Mathematical Ecology from Cott is it's, it's, it's a gem. It's very good. You have to know math. If you know math, this is one you will enjoy. And uh, then there's the Renshaw, which is uh, a book that uh, has differential equations, but also has stochastic processes at the same time. And uh, the book of Turchin, Complex Population Dynamics, is, it's a very dense book. It has a lot of advanced topics, but the introduction is very good. Okay? It's very nice. It's like the fundamentals of building things, I think. That's also very good references. So, okay. So today we had a very long lecture. We started late. We had a discussion about the organization of the of the uh, of the school, and well, that the lecture really you get started on, on models. Now, well, okay. Outside you will find the groups you are uh, uh, assigned, and also there will be a list of where your group should meet after lunch. Okay, or, I mean, if you want to meet right now, you're also able, okay. Uh, uh, but that, remember, it will be on the third floor and here, okay? And um, so, what you expect from you now, today, today precisely, you, you read your project, read the reference of your project, discuss and come to a consensus at your group, what is the problem? What is the uh, what is the system? The system. What are you talking about it? And do you want a five minutes presentation, just to for you to share with everybody what you understood and this afternoon. That's what we want for today. Tomorrow, 9:30 lecture uh, will be on interact interacting populations, and then you still work on your project. Uh, I will insist during the week that, I mean, this school has been going on for a long time, and more or less I know that you, usually you start, and on Tuesday you write a model and you solve it and so on, and on Wednesday the model just proven wrong. Okay? <laughs> there is a kind of evolution of the models, so uh, this will happen. You will have to sometimes start again, start again, and this is normal. You, you should uh, expect this, but you also should expect that sometimes it's the opposite. People discuss, 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 and you come on Thursday and you don't have even an equation. Now, this is also a red alarm, okay? Red, oh, you have to do something because, well, uh, 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 you're Thursday, you have to finish until Saturday, and you don't have even a model because the first one will be wrong. Then you have at least to go for some time. So there will be, I will insist every day that what stage are you... Uh, of, of your war, war and so on, and the monitors will actually monitor this kind of situation. If you have a model, the model is, is reasonable or not, and, uh, and so on. Okay, right. question. Here, yeah, this, uh, here. So, just, uh, okay, we have 10 groups, 10 presentations. We start at 6. We don't want to go until 9, okay? So, when I say five minutes, really five minutes, so because then we want also two or three minutes to make some questions and so on. Blah, blah, blah. If you want to make a presentation with, with project, with, with, with PowerPoint or whatever, or, or PDF, you may. But what is, what is really we don't want is that you come here and you spend your five minutes trying to fix the computer presentation, okay? So if you want, please check if it's working. You come a little bit earlier here, there's a computer which will be all the time here, or you want to put your computer and so on. But we don't want this kind of situation that we will waste our time while you are fixing your computers and your presentation, okay? But, as I, I say, there's no need to have a PDF or a, a PowerPoint. You can do it on the Blackboard. Just just uh, quickly explain the, how, what, what's your system and what's your project, okay? So, Thank you, and uh, see you at 6.